Welcome everyone back to the multi-agent systems talks, uh, which are organized by myself and uh, Professor Michael Uldrich. This is part of the uh, work we do at the Allen Turing Institute in the uh, multi-agent systems uh, special interest um, theme. And um, I just want to, as always, give you just a quick uh, round tour about what we're doing. So this uh, started with a big um, UK-wide symposium that we organized and, and took place in February 2020, just before everything went downhill with the pandemic. But luckily, we were able to do it. And we had uh, a full house, uh, more than uh, 100 faculty uh, from across the UK and also Ireland, everyone working in one area or another in multi-agent systems research. Uh, so the, the idea is that it's a very wide field and the UK is one of the historically one of the big contributors in this space, but over the years it's become very fragmented and no one really knows anymore who's who and what's happening. So we'd like to um, uh, try and bring people together and map out exactly what's happening in the space in the UK and also who's who to facilitate connections and uh, you know and new projects. So this was very nice. Uh, based, uh, based on that, what came out of it is uh, we have uh, the, we had the symposium and the symposium led to this online talk series we're doing now. All the talks end up on the YouTube channel and also there's the website on the Turing page, you can get more info. We have a map on, uh, on Google Maps uh, where we pin uh, point all the major labs in the UK that work in multi-agent systems research, including links and uh, topic areas. So if you have a lab that specializes in this space and you'd like to be represented in this map, then please get in touch with myself or, or Mike. And we also have this email uh, mailing list, which can be used for multi-agent systems related opportunities with a particular focus uh, in the UK, because uh, we're doing this within the Turing and uh, it's, it's mostly focused on activities within the UK. Uh, I mentioned already the talks end up online, so you can watch them online, including today's talk. And uh, before I wrap up, the last thing to mention is uh, the latest uh, initiative we started as part of the work of the Turing is this special uh, issue in the AI communications channel, which is in a similar spirit. So we, we invited uh, everyone who is uh, working in this space, who has a group that's active in multi-agent systems, to uh, submit a paper that uh, lays out the research agenda and some big successes and future research done by the group. And we're just uh, going through the, the papers and hopefully we'll have uh, the special issue published in, in, in the next uh, few months. And we, we already have a number of really nice uh, submissions there. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, just a brief context for myself. And now I'm very happy to hand over to today's speakers. Uh, one we have here already, and the other one will be with us in just a few minutes. I was told anyway, so let's hope it will happen. So uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to have with us two speakers, uh, both from the uh, Agents Interaction and Complexity Research Group at Southampton. I visited the group myself uh, a while ago, and I, I met you in person, Seth, so I know you guys are doing a, a lot of really exciting work in this space. Um, first, uh, first person is... Uh, Gopal Ramcharan, who is a professor in artificial intelligence and also a Turing fellow and a fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. Then we also have uh, uh, Dr. Seth Stein, who is an associate professor in the agency group and uh, also a Turing fellow and also a Turing AI acceleration fellow. So uh, very nice to have you here. Thank you very much for taking the time and I'll, I'll just hand over to you now. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thanks for the great introduction, Stefano. And it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I remember attending the workshop you organized in February 2020, and actually on the picture that, or the first picture you showed, that was the head of our group, uh, Tim Norman, um, and that was the last in-person, big in-person event that I attended before the lockdown. Um, so it's, yeah, nice to be, yeah. Uh, well, this is online now, but, but we've had lots of in-person uh, events already, which is nice. Okay, so I'm going to give a brief overview um, of the work that we're doing in Southampton. And because we're quite a large group, I'm going to focus on the work that I've been involved in. And it's, it's mainly going to be about my um, Turing AI Acceleration uh, Fellowship, which is on citizen-centric AI systems. And then Gopal is going to talk about some of his work as well, um, including the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. So I just share my slides, um, hopefully. You can see those, okay? Yeah. Okay, and um, and we we're 
we call the talk trustworthy and citizen centric multi agent systems, and I think that encapsulates well what Gopal and I are working on. Um, but let me just start by giving you a brief overview of the group that we're part of. So we're part of the agents interaction and complexity group, as you said, Stefano. Um, and this is a fairly large group at the University of Southampton. We have 20 academic, academic staff members. We have 12 postdoctoral research um, associates and 68 PhD students. And as the name of the group implies, we work on the topics of agents, interaction and complexity. Uh, clearly, the agents part is most relevant to this talk. So we work on algorithmic game theory, reasoning under uncertainty, some machine learning and optimization, logic and mechanism design. Um, but actually, the other parts of our group have a lot of connections to multi-agent systems as well. So in the interaction part, we do look a lot at human AI and human agent interaction, uh, trust and reputation um, and collaboration. Um, and in the complexity part, we're looking at things like swarm robotics, computational economics, complex networks, and also influence maximization. And of course, all of these are related to multi-agent systems. We have a number of large grants at the moment in the group. So I just mentioned a few of them. Um, Gopal is going to talk more about the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub, uh, which he's directing. Uh, then Tim Norman, our head of group, is running the MINDS CDT Center for Doctoral Training, and that's looking at the intersection of AI and embedded systems. Then we have a platform grant called Autotrust, which is on the human-centered Internet of Vehicles, and I'm a co-I on that as well, so some of the work I'll talk about will be related to Autotrust. Uh, MC, who's the PI, the pr principal investigator for this platform grant, is also an EPSRC established career fellow. And as, a, as uh, was mentioned, I've got a Turing AI Acceleration Fellowship, which I'll talk about in, in the coming slides. Um, we're also starting a new EPSRC program grant called FEVER. And that's on, um, on the future of electric vehicle charging. And again, in my talk, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the work we've already done on electric vehicles. Then my colleague Enrico Garding um, is heading the Center for Machine Intelligence at Southampton, which is bringing together all the AI related work at Southampton across faculties. And we also in our group in the AIC group have four fellows of the Alan Turing Institute. So Stuart Mid Middleton, Gopal, Adam Sobey and myself. And you can find out more about the group at this URL. Okay, but I talk about my research on citizen-centric AI systems next. And that's a five-year project, which started last year and is running to 2025. Um, but as I said, it interacts with a lot of the other work that is going on in our group. So a lot of the stuff that I will talk about is related to also the Autotrust platform grant, uh, which is joined with Warwick University and, and this new FEVER program grant, with, which is joined with Sheffield and Sari. Um, and the PI, the principal investigator of that is Andy Cruden from engineering. Then we've just established a new center in Southampton, which is the Low Carbon Comfort Center, which is looking at how we can reduce carbon emissions from buildings while keeping people comfortable at the same time. Um, and I'm one of the co-directors of this center. Um, and then, of course, the work on citizen-centric AI systems is also really closely related to the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub and the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems, the broader program. Um, but again, Gopal will talk a bit more about that. However, most of the postdocs working on my project are also involved in some of the TAS Hub projects that are running or that are being proposed at the moment. Okay, so what are citizen-centric AI systems? So first of all, I believe strongly that AI has a huge role to play in addressing really big societal challenges like climate change, for example. Um, so in emerging smart transportation systems, we can envisage connected and autonomous vehicles that are usually electrified, that can bring us efficiently from A to B and connect us to public modes of transport for on-demand mobility. And in smart energy, AI can help us schedule our electricity needs, schedule our heating to reduce carbon emissions, but to keep us comfortable at the same time. And I'll talk more about these application areas later, but that's where I really see the, the huge potential for AI systems. 
Um, but a key issue is, of course, that the end users, the citizen end users of these systems have to be able to trust these AI systems. Otherwise, um, they won't engage with them. And that's where I believe citizen-centric AI systems have to come, come in. So citizens have to be at the center of these AI systems and they have to meet, the, the systems have to meet certain criteria in order to be uh, seen as trustworthy. So I think they need to be citizen aware. That means that the systems learn the individual preferences and requirements and constraints of the citizen end users. The systems have to be citizen beneficial. That means that they provide value to every citizen, that they adhere to these constraints and the preferences to bring this value, and also that they consider incentives. So for example, if in a smart transportation system, someone is, is asked to delay their trip to reduce congestion, then they receive some discount um, in return for that. They have to be, of course, citizen sensitive, and that means that fair and equitable decisions are made, that similar people in similar positions get similar outcomes from the system, that no one is discriminated against. And they have to be citizen auditable. And by that, I mean the systems have to provide explanations to people for individual decisions or generally how they work. And they have to allow input from all the stakeholders to refine how these systems are working over time. So these are, are the broad features that I think citizen-centric AI systems and future AI systems should have. Now, how do we achieve that? And coming from the multi-agent systems angle, you won't be surprised that I see this as an inherently distributed multi-agent system, these future AI systems. So most importantly, I think in the future, in all of these application areas, we will have intelligent agents that represent individual citizens um, that may have access to the personal data of citizens. So for example, mobility data, health data, data about preferences, for example, um, how to trade off comfort and cost for a particular person. But importantly, this agent mainly works on behalf of that one citizen. Um, and so will be run maybe on a trusted personal device rather than um, all that data being made available to the service providers. Now that personal agent then interacts on behalf of the citizen with the service provider. So for example, the mobility on demand system or the smart energy uh, provider um, to make resource allocation decisions to, to dispatch on demand mobility, taxis to people to organize ride sharing and so on. Also, we have to consider other stakeholders in these systems. So government, um, policymakers, local governments that also need to understand how the AI systems work and have to be able to provide input in, in how they work. And for example, what objectives are prioritized by these um, AI systems. Um, and then finally, so one important aspect is that these personal agents will learn your preferences over time from observing your behavior patterns and maybe through some limited interactions. Um, but of course that leads to the cold start problem where a new user in the system may not have a lot of data and maybe the personal agent doesn't fully understand the preferences of that citizen. So there may need to be some way of aggregating preferences, but this has to be done in a privacy sensitive manner. Um, so that citizens completely understand what data is being shared and in what form and to what extent that is anonymized. So th this is the, the overall vision of how I think a citizen-centric AI system should be built and what it might look like. Um, but next I go a little bit more into the concrete research that we've already done on such citizen-centric AI systems. And I, I approach this a bit from different application areas. And that's the approach we're taking in this project is we're, we're engaging with stakeholders and we're looking at concrete problems and then we're developing these citizen-centric AI techniques, applying them to the specific problems, but then also, also thinking about how that generalizes to other application areas. So, okay, um, first maybe I'll, I'll outline some of the key research questions that we're trying to answer in this research. Um, and, and in this project. So one big challenge is at the uh, personal preference learning, as I mentioned 
before already. And here, some of the key challenges that we're looking at is, is how to deal with sparse data, um, how to elicit information from the citizens while also minimizing the cognitive burden on them. So we don't want to ask them lots of questions for our agents to learn their preferences. And as I mentioned, we want to look at how you can transfer knowledge learned from one citizen to others, but do this in a privacy sensitive manner. Then we're also looking at the service provider side, and here we're really interested in um, incentives, and we're applying some techniques from game theory and um, mechanism design to this. And here the questions are, how can we make good decisions that minimize the information that we need from the citizens, um, but also how can we use incentives effectively? How can we learn what works well um, and also, how can we minimize strategic behavior? So for example, in a ride-sharing setting, if we know that someone is in a hurry, we might prioritize them, but maybe that then opens opportunities for people or for agents to try and manipulate the system to, to claim that you're in a hurry just so you can get a slightly faster service. And then finally, we're looking at this aspect of explainability, auditability, and fairness, and how we can, we can ensure that these decisions are seen as fair and equitable. How can we explain decisions, especially in complex decision-making problems like ride-sharing, which are dynamic and sequential, take, take place over time? Um, and how can we enable input from all the stakeholders? So that's, as I said, the, state, the, the citizens, but also um, government and non-governmental bodies. Okay, so I, I get now to the specific application examples. I mentioned climate change as a really big motivating example and, and getting to net zero. So I just want to maybe remind everyone where currently our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from by sector in the United Kingdom. And that's the latest data from 2020. Uh, so by far the a uh, well, significant part of this and the largest part is coming from our transportation network um, and also quite a bit from the energy supply. And that's why the first application areas I talk about are in the area of smart transportation and in particular ride sharing, enabling a shift to electric vehicles, which connects to the energy supply as well, um, and also more generally connected and autonomous vehicles. And then I look more at the business residential part here, a big part of which it comes from building heating and air conditioning and ventilation. Um, and it's also connected to the energy supply. Uh, so this is in the area of smart energy and in particular, uh, low carbon comfort. And I, I'll see how I get on with time. It may be that I'll focus more on the smart transportation. Okay, so let's look at these uh, one by one. And what I'll do is I'll firstly give a bit of a motivation of why that topic is interesting. Then I'll outline some of the big research questions. And then I'll give you some pointers to work that we've already done in these areas. Okay, so starting with ride sharing. This is really about using our vehicles more efficiently by getting people to carpool, to share rides, to have taxi services that take more than one person. It's also looking at demand responsive transport. So you may have buses carrying more people, but responding to demand. So changing the schedule dynamically and picking up people at convenient locations and dropping them off at convenient locations as well. Um, and I'll skip over uh, just really briefly. So there are projections from the Department for Transport that show how much traffic is likely to increase over the next uh, 30 years or so, um, and there's going to be a huge increase regardless of which scenario you look, you look at. But one way of mitigating that is to really uh, switch heavily to ride-sharing services. Um, so in ride-sharing, you often have a problem like this where you consider a transportation network, you have different potential passengers or rider who want to get from one location to a destination, and you have vehicles that could potentially be shared. So here you might want to maybe pick up rider one first with the green car number two, and then rider B, and then get to the destination. And that saves you from assigning a separate taxi to each of these riders. But then from a citizen-centric point of view, um, some of the research questions here are about how we can model the preferences of 
the citizens in these settings, also of the taxi drivers, actually, if these, if these are driven cars, although they could be autonomous, of course. And these preferences might include the value of time, how inconvenient is it to wait longer, the value of emissions, do you care if your ride causes fewer emissions? And then, of course, there are health and safety issues to consider as well. You may not want to share with lots of people, especially uh, with COVID still being um, a serious concern. Um, or just safety that you may not want to share with people, um, or maybe only with people that you know. Then one big area is looking at the incentives here. So you want to compensate people for taking longer routes or maybe waiting for longer in order to share the ride. At the same time, you want to ensure individual rationality. So that means that people are better off using ride sharing than having their own private car or hiring a, ta a taxi just for a single person. And also, as I, as I alluded to before, you want to minimize strategic behavior. So if this system takes into account your value of time, for example, is there some way of, for the passengers to lie about this value of time so that they can get a priority in the system? And of course, that would be to the detriment of other riders who maybe are not strategizing and therefore get a lower priority. Ensuring fairness is important. We want to involve citizens in, in how these systems are built and how they make decisions. And we want to make sure that these are equitable and fair decisions as well. Okay, so moving on to some of the work we've done. In terms of incentives, we had a paper at Ichikai last year with Tatsuya Iwase from Toyota. And there, we exactly, we looked at this problem of um, strategic manipulation and of trying to truthfully get people to truthfully reveal their value of time to such a ride-sharing mechanism. And we describe that mechanism in here. Then um, Lucia uh, here has been working on a slightly different setting, which is looking at incorporating walking into ride-sharing as well. So where people are willing to walk to a common pickup point drive to a destination, and then from that destination, walk to their respective locations. So that might be useful in a commuting setting where everyone is trying to go to the same workplace or they all live in a similar area and work in a similar area. And, and we've looked at using approaches from coalition formation, but taking into account the inconvenience of walking and compensating people for that. Um, uh, Mia is looking at, and more on the preference side, looking at how we can trade off different um, objectives and preferences. So trading off economic preferences like fuel cost waiting times against environmental objectives and social objectives like fairness. And uh, Ido, who's a, a new postdoc who's just joined, um, he's looking at shared demand resp responsive transportation systems where you also incorporate transfers between rides. So you might be on one vehicle, you get off and then get on another vehicle to complete your trip. And he's looking at these, the acceptability and the incentives uh, needed to make that a reality. In terms of in incorporating people into this feedback loop, uh, Yicheng and Nikos have been looking at um, vote, using voting protocols for people on a, a shared ride to vote on whether new passengers should be picked up and how the route should be changed. So really to try and incorporate everyone in this decision-making process. And one of my PhD students, Alex, is looking specifically at accessibility and safety in these kinds of settings. Okay, moving on quickly to the next topic. Um, one area that we've done lots of research on is electric vehicle charging. So electric vehicles are a cleaner form of transport, but they place a huge strain on our electricity in, uh, distribution infrastructure. So a typical household uses about 10 kilowatt hours per day. Of course, that can vary depending on the household, um, but a normal typical electric vehicle to fully charge it takes about 40 kilowatt hours. So that's four times as much as a typical household. Um, a Tesla with a high, large battery will take 10 times as a normal, as, as a household uses in a day. And that will cause problems with the grid. And of course, the other problem with electric vehicles is the limited charging infrastructure when you're not at home. So the, the rapid charging points. And if you have a long journey, you might have to, to charge several times 
and it's difficult to plan these journeys um, and exactly where you need to, to charge. So here, some of the research issues we've been looking at is how we can incentivize people to do smart charging. That means deferring your charging um, to nighttime when, when, when there's more spare capacity um, on the grid. Uh, maybe also incentivizing vehicle to grid. Um, these, and these settings are quite challenging because there's lots of uncertainty. Cars arrive over time. You don't know how much renewable energy is, is available and so on. And then in this long distance journey setting, we're looking at how we can consider personal preferences of people. So you have some charging stations, for example, Tesla charging stations, which are extremely fast. They're usually not very busy. Um, but they're quite expensive. So Tesla just yesterday announced that they're opening up these charging stations uh, to all cars, not just Teslas, um, but they're still quite expensive. And, and so we want to look at how we can do this route planning, considering these trade-offs of cost, convenience, the safety of the charging stations and so on. The range anxiety as well, whether you're happy to run down your battery quite far before you charge. And we've done lots of work already in this field, and I could probably fill another whole talk just with this, but over the last 10 years, we've published over 10 papers. Most of these papers are with my colleagues, Enrico Gerding and Valentin Robo, but lots of contributors as well. Um, and that's looking at the incentives of smart charging mainly. And then Elna's, uh, who's on the call as well, I think she's a, a new postdoc on the citizen-centric AI systems project. And she's looking at this routing problem I described. And here we're taking the approach of, of talking to stakeholders first. And we've done lots of online surveys and in-person interviews. Over a thousand people answered our online survey and we had 200 in-person interviews to find out really what are the challenges and what are the individual preferences regarding cost safety and so on of, uh, when planning these long journeys. And Elnas is going to use different forms of reinforcement learning. Um, to automatically suggest these routes and adapt them based on feedback and based on what's happening um, during the journey. Okay, I'll, in the interest of time, um, I'm not, I assume Gopal has joined us in the meantime. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll, I think I'll skip over the connected and autonomous vehicles part. Um, so here, again, we're mainly looking at um, uh, how different intersections interact with each other and then how to coordinate intersection man management assuming autonomous vehicles, also how to, how to optimize um, traffic signal control. And if you're interested in that, we have an upcoming Ichikai paper uh, on that topic again with Toyota, but lots of other ongoing work in this area by Vahid and Behrat um, and Status, where we have a survey paper on privacy and trust in the internet of vehicles. Um, I'll also go through this really quickly. So another topic we're looking at is, is the low carbon comfort, how to keep people comfortable while reducing carbon emissions. Um, and again, there are lots of interesting challenges about learning personal comfort preferences, how to preserve privacy here. Can we use novel sensors like audio sensors to, for example, measure occupancy in offices and then control ventilation and um, heating? And we have, uh, this is a paper we did a while ago, but it's looking at exactly that problem of learning thermal comfort preferences with very few interactions from people. And then we have ongoing work by Jennifer, who's another postdoc on the project, and she's looking at audio sensors and using that to, to control smart buildings. But she's also looking at the general issue of privacy in audio and, and other applications that this might apply to. So yeah, just to conclude my part, I think in order to build effective AI systems to address societal challenges, we really have to model the preferences of citizens. We have to consider incentives. We have to treat these systems as multi-agent systems with different stakeholders. We have to explain decisions and we have to ensure fairness. And of course, this, this requires the multidisciplinary approach. I'm sure Gopal will talk a bit, a bit about that as well, involving lots of different disciplines. And you can find out more about the project here. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say. And I think we'll do questions at the end, maybe. Um, yeah, if you're happy to, I think uh, let's proceed with Gopal. Thanks, uh, Seth. And then we can open the floor for people to ask questions.
Is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Should I start? I don't know if you've already introduced me, but I can introduce myself. Yep, I, I have introduced both of you, and uh, I think you can just put up your slides. And uh, thanks for joining the call. No problem. Um, give me a second. So um, I don't have much time, so I'm going to do my best um, and maybe just um, just to say, I think the one takeaway from, from my talk will be, and I'm going to try and make a case for it, is to, to do more use-inspired use research and think about humans uh, taking a human-centered approach to multi-agent systems research. Um, so, as Stefano must have mentioned, I'm a professor of AI at Southampton, um, and also the director of the UKRI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. Um, I've been at Southampton for a long time. I'm probably part of the furniture, uh, as people say. Um, so I did my PhD here and seen the group grow and shrink and grow again over the last 20 years. So I've been here for 20 years. And um, and, and done a number of projects, really interesting projects at Southampton, starting from the, I think, foundational work we've, we did uh, on, uh, on the Internet of Things. At the time, we used to call it the ubiquitous computing, um, working on uh, defense-related problems with BA systems as part of the Aladdin project. And then realizing late in the late 2000s that, you know, these systems are going to be deployed with lots of people. So we started thinking, oh, how do we build this system such that this, they, 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 they add value to people's lives and started thinking about the impacts of climate change. And that's where we started focusing on, on smart energy systems and disaster response and taking a more human-centered approach to, to, to building these systems, working a lot with uh, colleagues at Nottingham University and Oxford University. Um, and with some of the work that I did, I had uh, support from the AXA Research Fund um, to continue that work on responsible AI. And currently I have a number of projects in train, some being completed now, um, and the main one being the UKRI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. And what I've learned over time is that, you know, you can build these systems to work for us and, and the multi systems community initially started with, you know, lots of theories about how humans will, or how machines or agents will work for humans. Um, and then transition to a phase where we'll try to control humans with, with, with agents potentially, um, or let agents do everything for us. Um, but there was little consideration very early on uh, for you know, human elements in, 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 in how we design, deploy, regulate, um, and, and govern these systems. And I think now that's becoming uh, an urgent concern as we see many of these AI-based systems deployed in our environments. But what I also want to uh, started reflecting on now, if you take my early 40s, is you know, what's the point of doing all this research? Um, if 20 years worth of research in the multi systems community doesn't have an impact on the real world, you know, what's the point of doing that? And I think everyone should question themselves about you know, when, when it comes to the value of the research you're doing, uh, which is why you know, in the last five years, I've, I've, I've gone into um, commercializing some of the research I've done, um, thinking more carefully about how you know, it adds value to businesses, to people's lives. Um, so created a couple of startups, which I'm working on and, and hopefully will um, make some interesting announcements for. Uh, and, and I'll mention them in, in my, one of my slides. So the application areas I've worked on, and I'm not going to make a case for smart energy systems. Seb's already done that um, really well. I'm um, going to talk a bit about what, where, where these problems come from, and, and what's the difference in terms of approach. So, and, and then go on to disaster response systems. Smart energy systems um, are not a, a new thing. Um, they were invented back in 1978, where people were starting to talk about agents um, uh, as part of controlling homes, controlling buildings. And uh, one of the early inventors of, of, of agent-based systems is Fred Schwepp, who's actually a power systems engineer. Started talking about you know, controlling um, large numbers of homes with spot pricing or homeostatic control um, with collaborative energy, uh, energy sharing. But the problem with, with that approach though is was that it was always about control. It was all about, about pressing that big red button that controls the system. So that's where we came in late, late 2000s to think about how we, we take a multi-agent systems approach to this. And it's not like we're dealing with very new systems. These are the early smart meters um, that we, we talk about very often now in, 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 in our daily lives. And back in 1978, people were already talking about the internet or two-way negotiations between agents or between homes. We're talking about the real-time measurement of, of people's behaviors. We're talking about demand response at the time and modeling human preferences. 
um, and, and making sure that they benefit the customer at the end of the day. So these ideas are not new, but what we've done over the last 10 years or 15 years is, is really try to change that to address current concerns, um, taking an, an AI-based approach to address these concerns, looking at home energy management, the use of energy storage in a variety of settings, including electric vehicles, and looking at the broader network issues around these um, a smart uh, energy systems. So how do we bring them together? How do we uh, make them usable by the humans? Um, how do we address the uncertainty or variability in, in energy production? So a lot of the work we've done at Southampton has looked at, at solving these problems. So research we've done, uh, for example, at the interface between these smart systems and humans, providing interfaces for humans to manage the energy tariff, for example, or providing them with agents that will change um, the times at which they will run their washing machines or, um, or optimizing the heating as, as Seb is doing. But the difference is that we don't just build the systems and, 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 and model the humans' preferences using a, a simple linear linearity function. We actually deployed them. And I've learned a lot um, working with social scientists, with human computer interaction uh, researchers how to deploy these systems to test you know how they will be adopted to test people's um, uh, appro appropriation, appropriation of these systems to understand where the pain points will lie when you actually try to deploy it at scale. So moving away from um, more of these human-centered issues you also have the network issues like for example dispatching a number of electric vehicles across a network vehicle to grid systems or um, uh, peer to peer energy exchange between uh, multiple homes and we've written a lot of papers about this um, these sorts of, of, of solutions. And they look at various techniques, so mixed integer programming techniques, um, machine learning techniques. Um, and I'm gonna to come to one of these uh, um, in, in a second. So this one, which is about demand response in power grids. And just to tell you how the thinking has evolved over the last um, 10 years. So initially when we looked at demand response in uh, energy systems, I'm not sure everyone is familiar with this concept, but it's about making sure that the, the grid can still work effectively um, balancing demand and supply. So if the frequency of electricity goes off the rails and all your appliances break down, uh, and that's not good for anyone. So the idea is to make sure that we're not consuming more than we can produce, uh, to make, make sure that the frequency of electricity is, is, is stable. So the techniques that we proposed looked at turning off certain appliances that you can turn off. For example, you can turn off a fridge for a few minutes. You can turn off a, a, a dishwasher for a few minutes and turn it back on. You can turn off um, an oven for a few minutes and turn it back on. And that by doing that, reducing the peaks on the grid. You could also do that with a battery uh, more flexibly without impacting on people's comfort. So what we looked at in, in, this, in the initial version in that paper and back in 2011 was, you know, how can we optimize the, the behaviors of these, of these homes or these appliances such that we flatten those peaks that typically uh, arise in the morning when everyone's turning on their toaster or their kettle, and in the evening when they're watching TV, playing games and, and, and cooking dinner. And uh, we managed to show that, okay, the algorithm will work and will flatten the grid and uh, will flatten the, 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 the demand and, uh, and we'll be able to reduce the carbon emissions associated with um, coal powered or gas powered uh, energy production. Um, however, it uh, also led to in, in inequities in the system. So typically, what we do is, is to equate comfort with consumption. So those who are um, consuming more uh, are more impacted if we start turn off, turning off their devices. Um, and, uh, or, or those are good, and, and it's easier to consume, to, to cut out you know, small, smaller um, uh, appliances or, or homes with uh, uh, lower demand. So what we next focused on was um, a problem where we had to shut down homes in developing countries. So in developing countries where there's not enough uh, power, so you tend to shut down huge parts of the network such that you can power the rest, which is more uh, sort of econ economic, economically valuable. So you can power industries rather than homes so that you can still run the country. So these are difficult decisions to make. So you tend to shut down lots of, lots of the homes in the, in the country. And typically what happens if you use these algorithms is that you end up shutting down most homes, uh, most of the richer homes. So in order to avoid this, this um, uh, inequality in the system, uh, we designed an algorithm that would shut down loads in a way that made sure that everyone was shut down in a fair way. So making sure that, that uh, the whole system was um, uh, more acceptable to the user because people do get really upset if you tend to shut them down all the time, um, as we've seen in some countries recently. 
So this is how we so we approach this problem in this way. And 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 going further, what I'm doing now is taking some of the ideas um, to my startup, Empathy Limited, where we are looking at these hybrid energy systems, making sure that they're all human centered, where we track decisions and, 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 and human uh, preferences in the system. We're also focusing on, on green hydrogen as a way of managing um, the uncertainty on the grid uh, from uh, variable um, energy production systems, and also looking at simulating systems of systems. So humans, human uh, based systems such as homes or mobility, and then predict their behaviors and, and then optimize uh, demand and supply on the grid um, uh, to satisfy uh, people's uh, comfort. So that's where I see a lot of uh, value coming out of my research, having done this for the last 15 years, finally seeing some results coming out and hopefully um, we'll be successful in the next uh, few months. So I hope to bring some good news back uh, later this year. The other area of, I've, I've focused on, and I've got uh, maybe five minutes to do this, um, is my work on disaster response, and which I still continue at the university uh, more than in the company. And um, uh, building a lot of work we've done in the last 10, 15 years, initially starting, as I said, with defense and security applications and moving on to um, uh, more um, uh, civilian applications like disaster response, where a number of uh, parties, emergency responders, um, uh, uh, health charities and, 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 and the local population need to work together. And uh, we address the problem of, of, of trust in the system. So looking at how do you gather data from these systems using crowds, using UAVs, using um, humans, uh, human teams and, and, and people you can um, sometimes trust and sometimes not trust. So how do we coordinate all these assets and how do we uh, gather information in a way that we can trust it? So we looked at systems, uh, all the challenges that emerge when you start interfacing humans and machines in, in different parts of this big um, system. And uh, what we did was actually build the algorithms, refine the algorithms and test them out with humans on the ground in order to make sure that people could trust them, that they were accurate, that they were delivering value to, 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 to the emergency responders. And that led to a lot of work around multi-agent coordination, crowdsourcing, um, uh, multi-UAV uh, coordination um, and control. Um, so just to give an example of what that looked like, um, so we build these, these uh, um, uh, multi-UAV uh, coordination algorithms that we deployed on some real UAVs um, that is now forms, forms the basis of, of uh, um, a larger program of work at Southampton on um, and, and Will is here, the, one of our interns who's been working on this and did this really nice video for us. Um, uh, showing how um, we can deploy this platform uh, with over you know, 100, hopefully 1,000 agents uh, later this year. Um, so that you can test out various swarming algorithms. You can test out um, various ways of controlling uh, these swarms um, and, and interfacing these with dif different teams. So you can manually allocate tasks. You can um, uh, test out, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a, how, how your, your coordination algorithm scale. And we have provide various interfaces um, for uh, operators to create tasks for the agents and um, for the operators to, to uh, analyze the data and, uh, and coordinate in terms of uh, the priorities that they want to set for the, for the swarms. So it's really nice test bed. Uh, we've been working on this now for the last five years um, and uh, just completed a project on, uh, on this uh, as part of the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. We've also worked a lot on, on interfacing humans with machines and, and again, progressing from a point you know, 10 years ago where we were looking at machines doing things um, uh, without us. Um, for example, here, it's an example of a, of a system or an algorithm that we wrote to coordinate emergency responders on the ground. And initially the algorithm just looked at, you know, using an MMDP, a multi-agent mark of decision process, computes the best task for each emergency responder, and then sends it out to people on the ground. Um, but that was not uh, acceptable to humans. They kept rejecting the tasks. And then in version two, we started looking at how we can model their preferences and model uh, the likelihood of them rejecting tasks because we, couldn't, we, we could not um, uh, infer that just by um, uh, it, with, the, with the previous model. So we added that bit and also changed the way humans interact with the system by adding a mediator in the system. 
So these sorts of experiments led us to learn a lot about um, how do we uh, do interdisciplinary research um, uh, to build responsible systems, to build trustworthy autonomous systems. So it's a lot about co-creation, co-design, um, uh, multidisciplinary team, um, taking a lot of risks, uh, trying out things in the real world, not just building a, a small demo, um, a toy demo that uh, you can show, you know, you, you beat the next algorithm by, you know, 10% or 20%. It's about testing how users actually adopt these systems, how, what are the barriers to adoption, um, and, uh, and, and testing how your algorithms or, or your robots deal with the uncertainty that's dominant in the real world. And, and really, a lot of work we've done in the last 15 years is with, is, has been done with practitioners and then users. So working very closely with industry, and, and that's really important if you want to have impactful research. And uh, in the last five years, uh, two years, um, we've been looking at um, the notion of trust um, and uh, really starting to think about now uh, asking the right questions. Um, so instead of just a simple question like, oh, can we uh, define standards for autonomous cars, thinking about how they will be deployed in, in the real world? Or will my children be safe on their way to school in an autonomous car? So bringing the social technical element. So thinking about you know, the standards that they need to be uh, tested against. So not just thinking about a Breast, breast cancer screening algorithms accuracy, but thinking about how what standard should it meet to be acceptable to the clinicians? Or how do we, for example, uh, deploy swarms of drones? Who will be responsible when they crash? So asking those questions forces you to think about um, how you build teams to, to, to solve those problems. So who, what skills you need to bring together um, and what social technical issues you need to address. So recently Seb, um, Nick Jennings and myself came up with this framework of human AI partnerships. And I think Seb has already talked a bit about the various dimensions of human AI partnerships in, in this previous talk. And uh, we propose this framework to try and, and, and ensure that um, when we frame new research uh, uh, projects uh, that involve the development of new AI or agents, we think more broadly about the social technical issues. So where, for example, in human AI partnerships, we think about humans and machines being in charge of the system at different points in time, where we don't just think of your, the, the, the machines are doing their thing and the human supervising, but there could be, could be a very dynamic relationship there. And there are different kinds of relationships that may be involved with, so cooperating, coordinating, competing, and really worrying about the feedback loops that, that change how humans behave in the systems. And we've seen a lot of this in, 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 in the deployments we've done in the past. And thinking about also the ethics and safety of, of these systems as part of the research you do. Um, and there are various examples in the real world. I'm not going to go to, into that. I don't have time. Um, so I'm just going to skip. And uh, the paper is there, and I can, I can share it with you. And, and, and it explains all, all, all the principles we, we define in terms of human AI partnerships. Uh, but I just want to skip um, quickly to um, the last bit so that uh, I think some of it Seb has covered. So I, I am the director of the, the, of the task program where we're taking forward some of these ideas and some of these research questions. It is one of the largest uh, programs looking at trustworthy AI in the world. Um, we are working now with uh, US institutions. Recently, we visited the University of Texas, uh, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Cornell, Stanford, and, and building connections with them to ensure that this program takes a, a, a very broad uh, and global approach to, to, to solving the problem of trustworthy AI and autonomous systems. So it's a large program. We have a very open approach to research. Um, these are the people on the team, the executive management team, but it is the team of more than 30 academics, uh, 15 researchers, and we have the nodes at various universities who will also bring on maybe 10 to 15 academics and researchers as well. And it's a very collaborative environment um, to do research, a very multidisciplinary environment. Um, and the whole goal of the program for us is to deliver these world leading best practices for the design, regulation and operation of socially beneficial autonomous systems that are trusted in, uh, trustworthy in principle, so designed to be trustworthy, but also trusted in practice. So thinking more broadly about the social technical issues I mentioned earlier, so regulation, governance, and, 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 and standards. Um, we have worked with the nodes of the, of the program to define some of the key autonomous systems research areas, um, which will be relevant to the multi systems community, obviously. A strong uh, component of our work is around respons responsible innovation. Um, so looking, thinking about people's um, uh, understandings of these autonomous systems, thinking about uh, bystander effects, thinking about skills required to build these systems, 
and consent and privacy in the systems. So beyond all the other you know, issues, technical issues, verification and validation, or flexible autonomy, or explainable AI, there's a strong limit of, of, of uh, governance and, and, and uh, responsible innovation in, in the program. And we have a number of cross-cutting values, EDI being a, a strong one uh, alongside e RRI. So how do you work with the Task Hub? We are open to collaboration. We published our guiding principles very early on in the program. We have agile, an agile process to create, create projects. So we're very open to collaboration. So people come to us uh, from around the, the network and we workshop ideas together and we create new projects every year. So last year we created um, eight projects. We also awarded some pump priming funds to 12 projects to bring in people from outside the, the, the funded projects. So we, we don't think that we, you know, the, the, the team in the task network is the only team that knows about trustworthy autonomous systems. So we, we ensure that um, everyone across the UK is who's got something to say about trustworthy autonomous systems so has a chance to, to work with the rest of the network um, and, and uh, align or, or bring a new uh, idea to the network. So we have funds to do that and we'll issue a call later this year. We've already done two of these calls uh, and we'll, we've already announced our second round of pump priming projects. We also run events which are open to um, the public, uh, not public, but to, to research communities. Some, some are public events. Um, and uh, we're organizing workshops at AAAI and, and, and the standard sort of research venues that you know. So I'd, I'd, I'd welcome all of you to come and join us in, 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 uh, in this program and, and participate in our projects. And it's all about doing good research for me and, and um, being collab very collaborative uh, in order to have an impact on, on the world. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the various research projects we have in train. So one's about human swarm partnerships in extreme environments. Um, this one's about the governance and, 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 and development of AI-assisted, uh, so, sorry, AI-assisted governance systems, so uh, using digital twins or simulation techniques uh, using AI to inform policy. Um, trustworthy human robot teams looks at um, uh, robotic surgery and uh, cleaning robots in a healthcare setting. Um, uh, Casper explains an interesting one which looks at using robots to um, in, in a, in a, to, to work with autistic uh, children, um, where you know robots are better able to, so to children find it more easy, uh, easier to uh, work with a robot to learn certain concepts. Um, trust me, I'm an autonomous machine, so that's taking a, a more social science perspective on the problem, understanding people's, uh, uh, trying to get, get people's understandings of these autonomous systems and, and generating narratives around the, the trust they put in these systems. And finally, last bit I'm going to talk about is this BLAST theory. So this is a more of a public engagement um, a piece where working with BLAST theory to uh, create this installation where the robotic arm will be looking after a bunch of cats and you wonder why, where's the trustworthy autonomous systems here. So here it's a lot about delegating to a robot the care of someone you love. So, let, so they've taken a lot of input from the community around healthcare settings where um, uh, robots maybe looking after of the elderly people or maybe um, doing some kind of surgery and here testing people's reactions to um, a, a machine that's looking after a loved one and we could not do a machine that looks after your grandma we can do it with cats potentially and there's lots of ethics um, uh, challenges that we need to go through and applications we need to go through to get this uh, system set up um, and procurement of this robot obviously uh, but that will be a public dis uh, publicly displayed, hopefully, and, and will be used for research as well. So I'll close on this note, and, and I've been asked many times, so what do we mean by trustworthy autonomous systems? And um, we've come up with a definition that many people in the network uh, tend to uh, agree with. Um, we can all find their bit in it, but uh, you can never please everyone. So um, hopefully, uh, we didn't want to give a definition initially uh, for trust, but uh, hopefully this one covers most of your concern. So I'm um, happy to take any questions on the research are we doing at Southampton and on the hub as well. Thank you. Thank you very much to both speakers, Sebastian and Gopal. Uh, very extensive uh, amount of work, Su super interesting. So thank you very much for uh, the talk. I'm handing over to uh, the audience. Are there questions from the audience about the projects and the research? I think uh, you can just uh, go ahead and un unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, I, I do have some questions. Uh, I wanted to 
bring the audience in first, but I think I can start. So um, the work you guys are doing in the autonomous driving sector, uh, I, I find very interesting. So I, I work with a company where we actually build the autonomous vehicles that drive around London. We call it Five AI. We were recently acquired by Bosch, so it's becoming bigger, and uh, this is a super exciting area. From what I can tell, you're particularly interested in the infrastructure configuration to ensure that um, we can maintain these systems efficiently. Right? Uh, for example. Uh, um, in terms of uh, spatially distributing the availability of the energy. But um, do you, um, in, in, in what sense, do you have connections with um, uh, companies or players who actually operate um, some of these uh, technologies in, in, the, in the wild? And I'm wondering um, if you do, what are their uh, considerations with respect to the problems in that space you're working on, for example, kind of restrictions or requirements? Yes, uh, maybe some information in that regard that you can share with us. Shall, shall I make a start, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we, we a lot of the work we do is kind of at a conceptual level. We run simulations, especially for the, the more complex intersection management, where we kind of use systems that are similar to the slot-based mechanisms where you assign slots to cars to go through intersections. Um, but one of my PhD students, who I briefly men, uh, mentioned, Bechrad, he's doing an IK studentship with Unix traffic, and they used to be part of Siemens, uh, so Siemens, no, Siemens Intelligent Transportation Services, I think. Um, and they, they are interested in testing some of the ideas in practice, um, but there, there are lots of challenges around that. So Bechrad is using reinforcement learning at the moment, and, and it sounds like we, we're not going to be able to put reinforcement learning policies into, into real traffic light systems, um, mm -hmm. because yeah, that's, the safety is just too important, and they just use the algorithms that, that they're familiar with. And there, yeah, lots of regulations around it and certification and so on. So that's quite unlikely as, as part of his PhD. But we've been discussing potentially taking some of the existing approaches and then just optimizing some of the parameters um, as part of the reinforcement learning. And, and we're hoping to do that in practice at some point as part of the PhD. But yeah, okay, overall, it's, it's challenging. Yeah, yeah, super challenging. I think in terms uh, of, of, of challenges, we're not just looking at you know the, the, the managing the infrastructure. We're also looking at people's perception. So we've done a lot of work on public perception of autonomous vehicles. And I think you know, you know with 5AI and the others, I mean, um, we've seen other examples where 5AI has been sort of, I'm not sure lucky, but they've done a good job. Um, but um, as soon as there's an accident, you know, whole projects get shut down and, and, and just because of public perception, right? Um, so that's one thing to address and whether, you know, we should be taking the, the, the Silicon Valley approach of building things fast and, and breaking, breaking things along the way rather than thinking through where, where autonomous vehicles would be most useful to start with, which is why we're running a policy lab, for example, with DFT, with other key uh, players in the, in the sector in June, where we're going to be looking at social inclusion in autonomous vehicles. So that's a huge, huge component of the program. Okay, thank you. Just checking again from the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? I'm not seeing any questions. So I think uh, everyone was probably very impressed with a very broad range of work you guys are doing. So uh, I think I wanted to thank you again, speakers. Thank you very much, both of you again, for giving the talk, taking the time. Um, I want to uh, say reach out again to everyone. This is an open platform. So if anyone here wants to deliver a talk, please reach out to myself or Mike. And we have a few more slots for this year that we can fill. And we'll reach out to the community, uh, community soon when we have the special issue uh, ready for publication in the IR Comms Journal. So thank you again, everyone. And uh, thanks to the speakers. And see you at the next talk. Yeah, thanks for listening. Bye. And thanks for inviting us. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.